No, he should. <laughs> Hi, welcome everyone to George Mason University's Observatory. I'm Dr. Peter Plafchan, and we have a great talk for you tonight and telescope tour. We have some wispy clouds at the moment. We will see if uh, they hold off long enough for us to open and show you a few celestial objects tonight at the conclusion of tonight's talk. Uh, we have these talks every other Wednesday during the semester. Our next will be March 3rd, and our speaker will be Dr. Jason Wright from Penn State University. So talks appropriate for all ages and interests, followed by guided tours of the night sky. And so to find out more info about these talks, you can uh, go to our website at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. Uh, or um, follow us on Twitter at GMU Observatory, and we'll paste a link to these uh, items in the chat later on tonight. And just to check, uh, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? All right, great. So we are located on the Fairfax campus of George Mason University in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Our um, observatory is located atop a research hall, shown in the photos here, uh, where we have a control room um, and uh, a, a dome. And we're going to be bringing you views tonight from our control room computer shown on the picture on the left. And you can see some of the photos taken by students uh, with our campus observatory uh, shown around in the perimeter of this uh, image. We put out a monthly newsletter, The Moon, and please sign up for our newsletter at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. It's free. And we have uh, fun discussions about recent events in space, both astronomically related and with regards to humans uh, in space and robotic space exploration. We'll be hearing of a big event happening tomorrow morning. Maybe Dr. Van Bell will talk a little bit about that uh, in a little bit if he just wants to, not, no spoilers, I'll let him tell you what's going on. I'd also like to let you know, for those of you that are new tonight, we have a philanthropic organization called Patrons of the Observatory, and we'd appreciate any tax deductible donations we may provide to continue to support the work we do uh, engaging in educating the greater Washington, D.C. community. Uh, as you'll also see in our newsletter, we have talks coming up with the Smithsonian, and we have a talk next month with Dr. Michael Summers on the future of humanity in space, and you can find that information on the Smithsonian website or send us an email at gmuobservatory at gmail.com for more information. We have different uh, patron support levels. And I'd like to thank our existing Big Bang Galaxy and Supernova patrons, as well as our new Nova Cluster and Star members. As I mentioned, I'm the director of the observatory. I'd also like to uh, uh, welcome Dr. Rob Parks, our deputy director, who's here with us tonight. Kevin and William, our graduate uh, teaching assistants for the observatory, also here tonight, and they will be giving us our telescope tour at the conclusion of tonight's talk and question and answer period. And we have a number of undergraduate and graduate student tour guides uh, listed there who give tours to our students, to the public. And we look forward to welcoming you back in person, hopefully sometime next fall. Uh, we've started exploring the possibility of that as a university. Uh, we'll have some more updates as uh, time goes on. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe during this pandemic. And thank you for joining us, especially as we're probably all fatigued from all the Zoom meetings that some of us have been having in our Zoom classes, uh, if you're a student. So it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce a colleague of mine uh, that I've known for a long time. Uh, and it's Dr. Gerard, his name is Dr. Gerard Van Bell. He's an astronomer at Lowell Observatory and he's chief scientist of the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer, both of which are located in Flagstaff, Arizona. I, I'm curious what one does with an interferometer for the Navy. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that uh, uh, tonight too, we'll, uh, in the Q&A. Uh, he is an internationally recognized expert in the construction and use of optical telescope arrays for carrying out astronomical observations at the highest level of spatial resolution. His telescope projects have been pioneering in the fields of stellar surface imaging, 
a characterization of exoplanet host stars. At home, he is a not quite incompetent home brewer and is restoring a vintage pin. Oh, you're restoring a vintage pinball machine. That's cool. I um, yep. I did try brewing once and I made wine, but I didn't quite shut down the fermentation. So I had exploding <laughs> wine bottles. So I'm gonna stick to my day job, but that's great that uh, you're brewing. So without further ado, Dr. Van Bell, the floor is yours. Welcome to our virtual observatory and evening under the stars. Well, thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. Uh, how's my sound? All good? Da -da. Very good. Okay. Let me take over the screen here. And this will stop the other screen scaring, but that's fine. Da -da, da -da. Here we are. Should have a nice view from one of the Apollo missions here. And how does that look? Very good. So I'm going to tell you a little story about Pluto and the vote that took place back in 2006. In fact, this is what the vote looked like. We'll uh, go straight to the spoiler here, but uh, we will build up to talking about this, but this was August 24th, 2006. I always like to few, give a few disclaimers because you know we live in a very legalistic society. So I'm gonna point out that uh, any views presented here are my own and are not any official view of the Lowell Observatory, even if they should be. And uh, I'll also point out that I am an astronomer by training. I am not a planetary scientist. And we take that distinction uh, very seriously at Lowell because uh, the, those are two very different categories of scientists. And then I'll also point out that as an astronomer, I'm prone to making broad uh, category, uh, uh, simplifications. And uh, a good example is how astronomers like to talk about spherical cows that are to order you know, three feet in diameter. So feel free to poke at any assumptions that I make. Uh, I will point out with assumptions and so forth, here's a picture of me on my very first trip abroad as a scientist to a, a symposium run by the International Astronomical Union, and we'll talk more about that. And during that talk, uh, the lovely Michael Feast, uh, Dr. Michael Feast from uh, South Africa pointed out that he had read this new paper by Dr. Van Bill and had found an error in it, and I actually got up uh, in the middle of that talk during the Q&A and pointed out that yes, it in fact had an error and I owned up to it. So I will own up to my errors, uh, most, most fully banking on the fact that you're probably gonna sleep through it anyway. So let's start with the backstory. Where does it all begin? Well, it all begins actually right here in Flagstaff about uh, 91 years ago. And it begins with a farm boy from Kansas called Clyde Tombaugh, you can see here on the right hand side. And he had been hired by the Lowell Observatory to uh, actually <laughs> do some pretty menial tasks around the, around the site, but also to be a telescope observer. And so he ran what was a 11 inch telescope. In fact, it's still up there up on the hill. And uh, we have uh, tours awaiting everybody as soon as COVID is done where you can come up and see our uh, Pluto Discovery Telescope. And he would sit for many hours on the business end of that telescope, uh, exposing glass plates to various parts of the sky. And he was able to uh, take pictures of the same portion of the sky over many nights and see a little spot move from time to time. And so he discovered things with that, including the discovery of Pluto. And so, you can see here on the left-hand side, we're on the front page of the New York Times, above the fold, as is very important for uh, our NASA colleagues so that to be above the fold. And uh, it talks about how this was uh, uh, found. Uh, it points out here in one of the sub leads, uh, this sphere possibly larger than Jupiter meets predictions. And this already points to some interesting future ahead for, for uh, for Pluto. Uh, fast forward many years, uh, in, in the late 90s, the Hubble Space Telescope, the best telescope at the time, was trained towards Pluto to try and take pictures, and this is the best we could do. And uh, we really couldn't get much detail off of this body. And so it was decided that we need to send something there. And so a probe called New Horizons was built and launched towards Pluto in 2006, at the beginning of 2006, and that's important to make note of. Uh, it was a very small probe on top, of, on top of a very big rocket, 
And if you look at it, you can see how this rocket comes off the pad like it's unglued. It really, really lifts off with a great deal of alacrity, uh, much more so than you see with other more ponderous ro rocket launches. Uh, and the idea was, you know, Pluto's a long ways away and let's get this thing going as fast as possible. And so we did that. We, uh, uh, our, our country put this probe together and sent it and it was the fastest thing off the pad ever. And uh, so it crossed the moon's orbit in nine hours. Uh, Apollo had taken three days to get to the moon. And so this was much, much faster than that. It zipped past Jupiter and stole a little bit of Jupiter's uh, orbital energy to get a kick. And it, it did that in 13 months. And it still took about 10 years to get to Pluto. Uh, there was a bit of a motivation there in the sense that Pluto is so far out in an, a, in, on a very elliptical orbit that they wanted to get there bef uh, before uh, what they thought was a, a possible uh, outcome of its orbit moving further out and getting even colder than it already was, which was its atmosphere uh, potentially would freeze out to the ground. And so they wanted to try and get there before that happened. Now, something else was happening uh, coming up until that point, which is more discoveries were being made. And in particular, there was a body that was discovered in 2005 and uh, the discoverer, Mike Brown and his colleagues over at Caltech had given it this code name uh, internally of Xena. Uh, and so they had found Xena and they even found that Xena had a little moon next to it. So they nicknamed that Gabrielle. So they had Xena and Gabrielle. And it was initially thought to be something bigger than Pluto. So suddenly we have an interesting prospect, which is you possibly have a new planet being found or something. And in fact, you possibly have a lot more of these things being found because the indications were that there were was that there were going to be more bodies found in the outer solar system. So what do you do about that? Well, um, a panel was convened by the IAU, and we'll get to more about what the IAU is in, a, in a, just a couple slides, to examine what it means to be a planet. And so this panel was chartered to examine the question in a very measured way with um, at a very reasonable pace in a sober way. And they delivered and, and they tried to have good representation as well from astronomers, but also writers. Uh, in the center of this photo is uh, Dada Sobel, um, uh, who wrote Galileo's Daughter, I believe, and some other books. Um, there were historians in there because they really wanted to examine the question from a scientific standpoint, but also from a cultural standpoint. And even though they said that you know, discussions were, were uh, contentious and hard to, to navigate, they said that they arrived at unanimous agreement on a proposal. And so that takes us to this vote in 2006. So what is the context for this vote? Well, the context is the IAU, which I mentioned before. The IAU is the International Astronomical Union. They're, um, they're the organizing body for all astronomers. And so they take care of a lot of the boring housekeeping for astronomy. They help, it, help us so that when I speak to a colleague in Japan or in Australia, or maybe have a chat with Peter over in Fairfax, Virginia, that what the, the sorts of language we're, we're using has a, uh, a common basis. So they take care of all the standards that are associated with astronomy. Uh, and every three years, they have a big meeting called the General Assembly where we talk about these things. Um, I ended up uh, being involved with the IU because I work on certain kinds of telescopes and we work on standards of, of uh, data formats where if I wanna put out a file from my telescope and have my colleague over in Munich look at the file and do something meaningful with it, um, he can actually or she can actually pull it up and read it in the computer because we've agreed to a common set of formats. And so the IAU uh, following on that thread decided, well, we should come up with a definition for the word planet. And we'll visit maybe the problems with that thought down the road in, in this talk, but, but this is what they thought of. And so that, that panel that I had just introduced to you um, had worked on this for a couple of years. And so they came up with a definition. They made a proposal to the IAU after studying this for two years. And their proposal basically says, 
you know, it has to be big enough for self-gravity to become a sphere and orbits a star and is not a star or a satellite. So let me distill that down to a single bite-sized nugget for you, which is big enough to be a ball, but not too big. So big enough to a ball to be a ball says when you have something in space and you throw material onto it, you get to a point where there's so much material on the object that its self-gravity will pull it into a sphere. If you have a lot of material, you get something so big that at the center it gets really hot and it will start nuclear fusion. That's how you get a star. But up until that point, everything is a planet. And the implication was that uh, there was going to be, at least at that time, 11 planets in the solar system, not nine. And so this is actually not a Pluto question. This is a planet question. What's big, what's the right size for a planet? And so basically you have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars that we're familiar with. There is the largest of the asteroids called Ceres between Mars and Jupiter. And it's actually big enough to be a ball. It's, it's about a thousand kilometers across. And it's at about that size when something becomes big enough to be a ball. And so then you have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. We have the gas giants that we're familiar with, but then Pluto and its moon Charon. And then the first of these uh, things discovered even at past Pluto, which didn't even have a formal name yet, just had a, really a telephone number, 2003 UB313. And then also Eris, this thing that Mike Brown had found just the year prior. So suddenly, we're getting kind of a uh, interesting traffic jam of planets here. So I was heading off to the IU in 2006, and uh, it was kind of an exciting departure. This was actually just around the time that we had this massive liquid bomber threat plot for flights. So it was a very chaotic day. I made a friend in the Burbank baggage claim, and she, for some reason, was interested in whether or not Xena would be a planet or not. And so uh, I actually had some interesting email correspondence with her over the time and ended up in Prague. Finally managed to get to Prague, where this IAU General Assembly meeting was going to be had. Uh, the IAU is very good at picking interesting locations for these uh, once every three year meetings. And uh, Prague is a, is a beautiful city. I recommend for you to visit it if you can. Um, so we get to Prague and there had already been a lot of chatter about this planet thing and about the planet definition. But the thing is the meeting is a two week meeting. It's a very long meeting. I showed up in the middle of the meeting because I don't wanna spend two weeks away from home. And so we did a week there, but when you get there, we found that something funny had happened. And what had happened was this panel that had produced this definition and produced this, uh, this uh, uh, proposal, they had been basically sideswiped by subcommittees that were working at the meeting. And these subcommittees came up with a different definition. They decided they had one that was better that they could come up with on the spot instead of this carefully selected panel that had debated things in a very careful way for the two years prior, uh, these people at the meeting decided to come up with something that supplanted this proposal, Resolution 5, and replaced it with 5A. And we can immediately see that 5A is superior from the standpoint of it has a lot more words. That's about it. <laughs> and so let's boil it down again. So previously we had a definition that basically said, big enough to be a ball. Well, what we have here is if we translate all this, we have a split in the definition where they came up with planet and then dwarf planet. Uh, and planet is something that orbits the sun. It's big enough to be a ball and it's big enough to be a bully. And we'll get to what that means. A dwarf planet orbits the sun and only the sun, mind you, for both of these. and is big enough to be a ball, but not a bully. And everything else has its own definition there in clause three, but basically the, the ball and the bully thing needs to be kept in mind. And uh, let's also point out that this continues in astronomy, somewhat archaic and somewhat questionable use of the terms dwarf and giant, which are getting kind of tiresome nowadays and should probably be retired. But uh, we'll, uh, 
we'll note that and move along. So what does that actually mean? Well, what it actually means is that dwarf planets is in their own little box. And this was very explicit. Dwarf planets are not a kind of planet. Even though elsewhere in astronomy, you have dwarf stars and they're a kind of star and you have dwarf galaxies and they're a kind of galaxy. And nope, not here. Dwarf planet is not a planet. It's got that word out there in one of those non-breaking spaces between the first two words. So there you have it. Now, this means that what the, galaxy, what the uh, solar system is going to look like is here. We have now eight planets and they wanted to call them classical planets. Uh, and then you have these dwarf planets. You have Ceres, you have Pluto and Charon, and then you have this uh, 2003 UB313. So this was presented to us and there was much chatter about this. And so the way the meeting works is that um, you do have resolutions and at the end of the meeting, you vote on these resolutions. And so for those of us that had stuck it out to the bitter end, uh, of a two week meeting and I had, you know, cleverly skipped the first half. So I was a bit more uh, enthusiastic about things. Um, we got to vote on these things. Now, mind you, it's a big meeting. It's about 2000 people that show up. But by the end of the meeting, about two thirds of that have cleared out. So by the time we get to voting, there's only about 400 of us, 400 of us voting on this very momentous thing. And so they did very careful checking of you against the rolls when you entered the hall. And then they issued us our vote cards here. You can see the nice yellow vote cards with uh, myself and Brian Mason on my right and uh, Jenny McSwain from Lehigh on my left. And uh, the, the careful checking of the rolls soon denigrated into a very contentious debate over the whole thing, a uh, tremendously sloppy use of Robert's rules of order and uh, the whole thing was pretty much a train wreck from a procedural standpoint. I mean, I'm a, I'm a advisor for a college fraternity here at Northern Arizona University, and I see 18 to 21 year old men do a better job with Robert's Rules of Order than the IAU did. So it was kind of a, kind of a, a, of a mess, but I will give the IAU their due. So let's take a moment here and discuss, you know, the usual FCC fairness doctrine. Let's discuss some good things of the IAU. So the IAU does very good things for establishing standards and promoting communication. So for example, there were other resolutions that were voted on in 2006. The first three are very kind of meat and potatoes sort of astronomy, de defining processions, working on reference systems. Uh, time is always talked about. The, the idea of time being defined by the spin of the earth is something that uh, kind of roots a lot of systems in the in, in throughout the world, and uh, you know the uh, a good definition of time is very important for orderly civilization, but it can be kind of messy because the rotation of the Earth kind of skips and starts, and, and the the rotation of the Earth wobbles around some, so that needs to be carefully monitored. Uh, and then there was also a good resolution on uh, uh, astronomy communication, so that was noted. And I will also point out that there is a long history of planets coming and planets going. So for example, in the early 1800s, the first four asteroids were discovered. And for about 30 years, they were the only asteroids. And so in fact, if we look at this textbook here from 1826, you can actually see the solar system. It has the outer parts of the solar system with Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus. Uh, and then the inner part of the solar system, you see Earth, Mercury, Venus, but you also see Vesta and Ceres, Juno and Pallas. And in fact, they were considered planets because they were the only asteroids known about for quite some time. But then come the 1840s, we started to find a whole slew of asteroids. Um, you can see in this chart here, this is the number of planets over time. Uh, Ceres was found. And then we have this stretch, you know, Juno, Pallas, Vesta found. And then nothing for quite some time. And then all of a sudden they got good at finding asteroids and they realized, hey, we're finding a whole bunch of these things in a very short period of time. Um, by 1852, they had kicked asteroids out of the club and they had relegated them to, uh, unfortunately the term minor planet is now uh, kind of a, a historic association with the word asteroid. And so they have been put in that box. There's this little blip here for Pluto that had uh, you know, a good 70 year run or so, but planets come and planets go. And so there is a 
element of defense for the IU here. And uh, uh, people like me calling it the FIFA of astronomy is maybe a bit unkind. Anyway, there was fallout from this vote. So what was the fallout? Well, the problem is there were two pieces to this definition, big enough to be a ball and big enough to be a bully. And so I've already touched on the first half of it, which is big enough to be a ball. When you have something in space and you lump material onto it, you finally get to a point where its self-gravity makes it a sphere. Um, small things like asteroids that are 10 miles across, 20 miles across, even 100 miles across, they, they are often found to have, say, dog bone looking shapes or potato looking shapes. And that's because they don't have enough self-gravity to, to, to pull things into a sphere. Um, the big enough to be a bully part is another element of it where in its orbit, a planet, according to this definition, according to this resolution from the IAU, has to be able to clear out its orbital zone. There has to be a, um, a, a lack of stuff in its way because it's not only big enough to evolve, but it's even bigger than that. It's, it's big enough to be gravitationally dominant in its orbit, so there's nothing in the way. So this prompts a question, which is, uh, let's have a little pub quiz here. So let's start off with, is the Earth a planet or not? The Earth, the Earth. And uh, I will now present to you proof that the Earth is not a planet. And the proof is it hasn't cleared its orbital zone. There are things that hit the Earth all the time. In fact, we recently in 2013 had a very notable impact of the meteor that hit uh, Chelyabinsk. Uh, this thing was you know, about the size of a big truck, maybe a small house uh, hitting very fast and uh, blew out all the windows in Chelyabinsk as it did an air detonation on the way down. And so that is, Definitive evidence that the Earth has not cleared out its orbital zone is getting hit by stuff as it orbits still. Um, maybe Jupiter. Jupiter's big. Jupiter has a lot of gravity. Uh, maybe Jupiter's a planet. Well, again, proof that Jupiter is not a planet because it get, got hit by Shoemaker-Levy 9 back in 1994. Here's some nice images from Keck and um, basically showing uh, the impacts of it getting hit. It's kind of a, a messy photo because uh, unfortunately, Jupiter was very low on the horizon at the time of the impacts, and so they were looking through a whole bunch of air trying to take pictures of this. Um, and I'll point out, these are not uncommon events. Um, we have had stuff hitting the Earth very frequently. Um, at the level of Chelyabinsk, it happens every few years or so. There are even bigger events that happen every hundred years or so that if they were to happen on the wrong spot on the globe would basically wipe out a city. Um, the most recent one was the 1904 Tunguska event. It fortunately was nowhere near a city, but it basically took out a few hundred square miles of forest land in Siberia. So um, there are problems with this definition, with this whole clearing the orbital zone business. There are some bigger, broader problems that I would like to at least air, um, which is the first of which is we're, when you're defining a planet this way, you're not talking about the planet's physical properties, you're talking about its dynamics. You're talking about what a body does rather than what it intrinsically is. And so the PI of the New Horizons mission, Alan Stern, he always likes to call out how this fails the Star Trek test, which is you can't just look out the window and say, it's a planet. You have to study it and watch it move and you know, see what it does. And related to that is the question of, it assumes omniscience. You know, to, to be able to say, oh, this body has cleared its orbital zone, you have to not only know about it, but you have to know about all the other stuff in that planetary system. You have to know not only say, for example, what does the Earth, uh, what is the Earth's size, but what is the Earth's path in its totality around the sun? And there are instances, like on the screen here, when you wanna know if something a planet in a big fat hurry. Now, there's another little wrinkle on that definition in IAU Resolution 5A, and it was very specific. And I remember this because we were there for the definition and we were there for the debate in the hall in 2006 as we wrangled over this new Resolution 5A. And it specifically says that to be a planet, you must orbit the sun, nothing else. None of the other stars in the heavens qualify. And so that means there are eight planets in the entire universe. Uh, 
And uh, this is obviously not true. We've been very successful in the sciences in astronomy of finding planets around other stars. Um, here's an example of some uh, uh, planetary systems that the Kepler spacecraft has found over the past 10 years or so. And uh, yeah, so having it limited to being just the sun is actually downright silly. So there's another thing that um, is a big problem with this resolution. And, you know, I, I hate to be conspiratorial about things because it, uh, it's just so unfitting and so uh, cliche in these times. But this sort of thing points the way to this IAU resolution business actually being a bit of a hit job on Pluto. And the, 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 the reason being, there was no definition of the upper end. And that's actually where life kind of gets interesting. What is not too small to be a planet, but what is too big to be a planet? There's no definition for that there in this new writing of Resolution 5A. And so uh, I think there is some clear indications in the community of astronomers what people think should be the upper end. Basically, where do you get something that starts to have fusion on the inside, even for a part of its life? But uh, this was actually not put into the definition. So the, um, the final thing is um, the, 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 de the definition is kind of location-based. So um, the whole business of, of has something cleared its orbital zone, uh, there was an interesting attempt put on, to put math to that by um, uh, a journal article by Margot in 2015. And uh, this is a plot from that uh, journal article where uh, they basically came up with a mathematical definition of uh, what does it mean to clear your zone? And that is linked to how big is the object and how far the object is away from the sun. And so a problem with this definition is that to clear your orbital zone, you actually have kind of put into the secret sauce an ingredient, and that is time. As you move further away from the sun, the orbits take longer and so to clear your zone, you need more time. And you can make up for that a little bit uh, with a bigger body, but uh, you only can get so far with that. So as we have it seen, drawn right now with our solar system here, um, we have the terrestrial planets, the rocky planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. We have the gas giants out here. And then these so-called dwarf planets are here. But there's a curious thing that happens, which is if you look at this closely, you realize that if you take Mars and move it out to Eris, or if you take Mercury and move it out to Pluto and do nothing else to the body, they stop being planets. Even though you haven't changed anything intrinsic about the body, they stop being planets just because of where they are. And that strikes me as a, as a pretty severe problem. Now, one of the things that people have mentioned to me is the size disparity between Pluto and Earth. And so people point out, well, you can't have Pluto being a planet because it's so small. It's so small compared to the Earth. It's six times smaller than compared to the Earth. Well, let me point out something else that's six times smaller. Earth is six times smaller than Jupiter, and you don't see anybody complaining about that. Um, in fact, the physics that you use when describing Earth and thinking about Earth are much more similar to Pluto than to Jupiter. Jupiter has no solid surface. It's a big lump of helium and hydrogen. There is, um, uh, on Earth, you have plate tectonics, you have weathering, you have a hydrological cycle. These are all things that happen on Pluto too. And so you're actually talking about much more similar sorts of things going on here. Um, I see a hand up for a question. I'm going to wait till the end of the talk because I don't want to jeopardize the Zoom link thing. <laughs> so I'm going to keep on going. Thanks. Um, now, not only do you have this size range of like a factor of 35, if you were to include Jupiter all the way down to Pluto, um, the, the planetary sciences actually really don't have much ambition in this regard because Stellar astronomers like myself and Peter will basically say, you know, hold my beer, because if you look at stars, they don't range in sizes by a factor of 35. Stars range in size by a factor of 6,000. If you look at the whole range from the smallest stars, these things that are the, uh, the coolest, smallest objects that are about a tenth the size and mass of the sun. And if you go up in size to things bigger than the sun, you get Sirius, which is very small, still compared to Arcturus and Aldebaran, and then Aldebaran compared to Antares and our friend Betelgeuse and Orion, 
are still small compared to the biggest stars out there. So there's a factor of about 6,000 in, in size here. And the stellar astronomers don't pitch a fit about that. It's just, you know, that's fine. So anyway, there are unfortunately real world implications with having a bad definition out there. So let's look at one that actually hits close to home for people that are good at this kind of thing. Um, right now, a hot topic in the planetary sciences is looking for something called planet X or planet nine. Uh, this is hypothesized to be a pretty large body very far out in our solar system. It's thought to be maybe five to 20 times the size of the earth. And it's thought to have a big enough size and a big enough amount of gravity associated with that size that it basically corrals all the small bodies that are out there. Things like Pluto and Sedna and Orcus and all the other dwarf planets, the things that currently fit into that dwarf planet box out in the outer part of the solar system. And uh, so the problem is if you, again, turn back to this definition we had of uh, what it means to be a planet from the clearing your orbital zone business in that Margot paper. One of the things that was pointed out is that planet X is probably gonna be in this red box if it ever gets found. This is the hypothesized distance and the hypothesized size of it. But if you zoom in on that, one of the things you'll find is if you extend all these cutoff lines all the way through, especially the one that's associated with the current age of our solar system, not these lower lines that's associated with the far future solar system, about half of this box get cut off. So you could actually find something that's five earth masses in the outer part of the solar system. And if it's just small enough and just far enough out at five earth masses, it's still not a planet because of this clearing your orbital zone business. Um, there's been interesting and uh, challenging news uh, just recently, February 11th was this preprint that actually has pointed out that there probably is no planet X out there. Uh, it looks like um, these bodies that have been thought to be clustered in certain parts of the outer solar system, if you plot the red hits of where, we, where they've been found and then you overlay where we've been looking, that's all the white here, uh, they tend to turn up in the places where we've been looking. And the prediction is that there is no planet X that has been corralling these planets in a certain area. Basically, once we start looking elsewhere, we're going to find more of these outer bodies out there as well. So it'd be interesting to see how this resolves. So in the end, it's, it's not about Pluto. It's not about planet X. It's, it's about having a good definition. And without a good definition, there are problems. So let me give a, an immediate practical example, which is we have planets, which right now go under the label of dwarf planets, uh, that have been unvisited. So one of the things that US space policy has really uh, had in its blood for decades now is to be first. Um, we can debate the merits of that, but uh, that's, I think, a, a pretty defensible statement. You know, they're, after a string of not being first in the early 60s in the space race against the Russians, uh, the U.S. space program established a pretty dominant position and really wanted to be first doing pretty much everything. And historically, that means that there was a desire to be first to all the planets. And so the Voyagers got us to all the gas giants. Uh, New Horizons got us to Pluto. But nowadays, if it's not a planet, it's hard to get funding for it. Fortunately, that is changing somewhat. Uh, we have some missions coming online that'll take us to, say, the Jupiter Trojan asteroids. And other, uh, uh, the Psyche mission will take us to a, uh, a non planetary body, uh, another asteroid, and, and explore this interesting world. But sadly, we have no uh, burning desire to throw together missions like New Horizons to go to some of these uh, ice dwarfs that are in the outer part of the, of the solar system. So things like Eris and Sedna and Makimaki. Um, and so that's a problem. And that's because I think in part because they don't have this special planet status. So what now? What do we do with this? Well, let's take a moment and think about where we are and how we got here, which is there is a question of physics versus metaphysics. Um, this is where I dust off my liberal arts degree for my undergraduate. And uh, we transition briefly out of the realm of physics um, 
you know, the benefits of a classical education, as Hans Gruber discussed it back in the uh, lovely Christmas classic Die Hard in 1988. So where did the IAU trip up in all this? So the IAU tripped up in doing their work in housekeeping and doing their work in met metrology, but then stumbling into philosophy. And so basically the IAU is very good at housekeeping. You know, what is the name of this ruler? What do we call this ruler? Uh, they're very good at metrology. What is the, the length of an inch? How big is an inch? But the philosophical question that they seem to have made a mistake by tangling themselves up in with is saying, what is a ruler? And it's very hard to box in what a ruler is because, uh, you know, think about it. Think of any definition that you can come up with for what is a ruler and uh, try to not have it be, be a falsifiable definition. And, uh, the, you know, some of these very... Uh, esoteric questions on, you know, what is a thing can be hard to answer. And I think they, they kind of ran afoul of that. Um, there's a, a good Twitter feed to follow that uh, we'll have remarks about this is from Dr. Phil Metzger. Um, he had a good quote just uh, the other day where he was talking about, um, you know, it's not just words. Words have meaning. Words are important. I think coming out of our most recent presidential administration, we've learned that words are important. Uh, and, you know, that truth is important. And so we have to be very good about that. And one of the things I, I like this quote very much of him pointing out that, you know, this is a skill that our brain developed to uh, build civilization, basically. And, uh, you know, language comes out of the fact that, you know, we accurately have ways of categorizing things. Um, and so this is important. Um, the current state of affairs is that we have a very bad definition from the IAU. And since it is a very bad definition, it is routinely ignored. Planetary scientists do not use it. Planetary scientists uh, basically think that dwarf planets are full-blown planets. They think that the, uh, the phrase dwarf planet is a legitimate one to describe a type of planet, but a type of planet, not its own special thing. Astronomers uh, in the last 20 years, we've gotten very good at finding planets around other stars. And when we talk about planets around other stars, we use that word. We don't say something else like exoplanets all the time. Um, we even talk about a thing called road planets, where we can have bodies that are ejected from their planetary systems, you know, forever doomed to wander in the space between the stars. And these things are interesting. And we uh, consider them things that uh, uh, are still planets, despite the fact that they're not even orbiting a star anymore. And so I would say that, you know, the, the IAU has done themselves a very uh, bad thing here. I think that they do very valuable work in other arenas, but they've gotten a bad ding for this because of this very high visibility, very bad outcome. So what should be done? My solution is, nothing, <laughs> which is to say they should roll back the clock. We should have another vote at another IAU me meeting and rescind the resolutions 5A and 6A from 2006, basically just chuck them and be done. And, uh, you know, you don't vote for King and you don't vote for these kind of definitions. And this would clean up the fact that the IAU has no definition for the word star and they have no definition for the word galaxy, even though they were in a big fat hurry to make a definition for the word planet. And so, unless they want to go there, and I can assure you they don't, um, we should just set it aside and do what we've always done, which is let scientific discourse come up with the answer. It's worked up until now. And in fact, it's kind of anti-scientific to uh, wall off certain words and say that you can't use certain words certain ways. Uh, in fact, that is a very anti-scientific stand. Um, if you have to have some kind of definition. The next best solution is to go back to the original IAU resolution five, which is big enough to be a ball and nothing else other than the fact that it can't be too big, it can't be a fusion reactor, uh, but nothing related to this business about orbital zone. Um, the implications of a definition like that would be all these extrasolar planets that we have out there, like this TRAPPIST-1 system, which has six planets going around a very small star, um, would be included, including entire classes of planets for which we have no analog in our solar system. 
Uh, for example, we have a whole series of bodies that are being found that are in a size zone between the smallest gas giants that we have in our own uh, solar system, the Neptunes and the Uranuses, and uh, larger than the, say, Earth-sized planets. Uh, there's a whole new taxonomy that, that uh, awaits being uh, addressed for those uh, as planets. And so that has implications for things outside of our solar system. Inside of our solar system, we can break things up into the major planets. We can still say the big eight are the big eight um, and they're the gravitationally dominant bodies in our solar system. In fact, if we wanna talk about gravitationally dominant bodies, then we go down to four planets because really it's the giants that have all the say in what happens in our solar system. But then we could say, okay, we have the eight major planets and then we do have these dwarf planets. We have one dirt dwarf that is Ceres in the, in the uh, asteroid belt. And then we have this ever increasing number of ice dwarfs in the outer solar system. Uh, and so just like the rocky planets have a family of four, the ice dwarfs will have a family of four and growing and uh, big families are nice. This is what the solar system will look like. And we have very nice categories. We have the rocky planets here in the center. We have the dirt dwarfs, like I talked about of which there's only series. We have the giants here and then the ice dwarfs hanging out here on the outskirts and nice, well-organized families. Um, where people get a little bent out of shape is when you actually show them the full roster uh, as far as the, the terrestrial world, starting with earth and going down, you can see how much gravity is associated with these smaller and smaller bodies. And you start to get actually a lot of bodies as you look at things. Some of these things are moons of other planets, um, but are large enough of their own right to be considered and, and, and actually are considered by the planetary scientists to uh, basically be planet-like uh, masses. Um, they certainly, uh, as large gravitationally self-organizing bodies, show similar kinds of physics between each other. And so they, they, uh, they get addressed that way. Now, some people will say there's too many planets. And, you know, think of the children. Think of the kids that have to deal with this many planets. And for those people, I have another pub quiz, which is the next slide. So on the next slide... There is a grouping of things, which there are a lot of, but if you can recognize most of them, you don't get to make this argument. There. And so if you can recognize more than four of these, I would say you don't get to make the argument that there's too many planets. And scientific definitions never had, you know, a uh, reductionist sort of a, a constraint on them anyway. So anyway, to wrap things up, Whatever became of Xena? Well, Xena became Eris. That was what the official accepted name was. Um, Mike Brown thinks it's appropriate. That it is the goddess of strife and discord because of um, its hand in helping push along resolution five and 5A. It's actually roughly the same radius, but more massive than Pluto. It's made up of heavier material. So in fact, it is really the, the, the bigger brother of the of the ice dwarfs in the outer part of the solar system. Its satellite uh, was named Dysnomia, which is the daughter of Eris, the goddess of lawlessness. Huh, lawless, lawless. What comes to mind with lawless? Anyway, we do have nice pictures of a world on the outskirts of our solar system. And I'm hoping that uh, we can get past all this uh, lexi lexiconagry and, and uh, all this wordsmithing and send more spacecraft out there to investigate these other ice dwarfs out there because these are very interesting bodies to visit. And with that, I will hand it back to Peter and take some questions from the audience. All right, thank you. All right, so Zach has a question. Yes. Uh, Zach, go ahead. So, okay, so... Oh, I actually, um, I honestly think that, like, I was, like, kind of annoyed that Pluto got demoted, because, like, I was thinking, like, oh, I mean, I mean, to be fair, Pluto is a dwarf planet since before I was born, <laughs> I guess, so, but yeah, um, I really do like, I think that, like, we can, like, the fact that 
And, like, the issue is that, like, there aren't, like, the, we found, like, a Pluto-sized world orbiting another star, but that's not considered a dwarf planet. That's considered a planet. Why is Pluto not a planet? And then I realized, oh, the, uh, apparently the IAU's definition only applies to the solar system. Yep. That's dumb. <laughs> like, either make it universal or don't have it at all. And, you know, I've, I've, I've talked with people in the Exoplanet Commission. They have these commissions that form the bits and pieces of the IAU. And, and their party line on that is that, well, you know, obviously our, um, we, we are, we have adopted a working definition inside the commission that basically means that the, the exoplanets we find around other stars are the same as the planets here. And, and I think that's all fine and good, but you know, the, 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 the point of the matter is that the IAU is a very legalistic organization. And if they want to have the exoplanets be officially planets under that definition, they have to adopt a resolution that says so, and they haven't done that. Uh, the IAU basically, I think, figured out in 2006 that the uh, planet resolution uh, was the third rail in astronomy, that uh, it was something you don't want to touch and uh, have never revisited the question ever since. Um, maybe they will someday, but uh, so far they've, uh, I think to their discredit, uh, said that everything is fine and they don't want to talk about it anymore. And there isn't a single astronomer out there I know who says that this current planet definition is any good. You know, they may be for or against whether or not Eris and Makemake and Pluto and other bodies should be in the club, uh, but nobody I know says that it's any good. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ben Bell. I forgot to say, let's thank Dr. Ben Bell for his excellent talk because Zach raised his hand so fast. So let's give a virtual round of applause for Dr. Ben Bell. I'll clap for everybody. Thank, thank you. you for a wonderful talk. And you can use your reactions to put applause on the um, on the Zoom chat. Wow, wonderful. So if you do have uh, questions to ask our speaker, please do post them in the chat. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit, uh, Dr. Van Bell, about uh, what you do um, and talk a little bit more about uh, the work you do at Lowell. So you're where it all happened. You're in the, the dome where it happened, as it were. Uh, yep. with the, the Pluto uh, discovery, but uh, your research is not, is not related to Pluto. So what, what do you work on? So Lowell Observatory is a fascinating place to work because we have this very long history. Uh, we're a very old institution, more than 125 years old, which for, uh, for a US institution is very old, but we're also still on the, very much on the cutting edge of astronomy and, and astronomical technology. And so uh, I fit in as, a, a bit of an oddball astronomer with how I like to work on instruments and build new instruments. Peter, Peter does, uh, Dr. Plavdrin does a lot of the same thing. And um, the sort of things that I work on uh, try to make really big telescopes out of a lot of small telescopes. And this has been going on in astronomy for a long time now with radio telescopes because it's easier to do, but I work on things that uh, actually use light like what our eyes see and you know, take small, small telescopes that are 20 inches in size or 40 inches in size and spread them over the landscape about the size of a football field. And then link all that light together so that it synthesizes a telescope that has the resolving power of one the size of a football field. And so doing that, you can actually look at very, very small things on the sky. Um, if, the, if we could see very faint things on the sky, we could actually take nice pictures of Pluto, just like New Horizons did, but from the ground. Um, but the Achilles heel of these sorts of telescopes, at least currently, is that um, we, we are very good at making a big telescope out of very little glass. But since we use very little glass, most of the light is falling on dirt between the glass and we're not very sensitive. And so we can see bright things like stars at very high levels of detail, but things like planets or dwarf planets, depending on how you wanna define things, we can't really look at right now. So um, the idea is push this technology along, improve the sensitivity, and then maybe we won't need to send a spacecraft 
10 years through space to get to a place like Pluto or Eris to take a picture like that, we could just do it from here. So that's the sort of stuff that I work on. That's wonderful. Are you, uh, I know we got one more question, let's uh, follow up on this. Are you involved with any ideas to put uh, interferometers on the moon, for example? So I am interested in, in, in seeing about that happen. Um, the, the, the short answer is uh, putting one in space is, is, is my desire, is one of the, the things, actually a project I'm actively working on. Um, what will probably happen is maybe not on the moon, but uh, mounted onto a satellite. And so uh, a very interesting thing that I'm working on is a project where um, we take a, a small satellite. And so the, the problem with interferometers is that they want to be big. You wanna actually have uh, some mirrors that are far apart from each other, sending light to a, a central combining spot. And this needs to be pretty big. And it's hard to put big things into space because usually you got to package things up into uh, a tight little compartment on the nose end of the rocket and shoot it into space. And so what I'm working on is a project where we take a small thing in the tight, small end of a rocket and shoot it into space. And then it builds itself once it gets up there. And so uh, I'm working with a company called Made in Space where uh, they have flight qualified 3D printers for space. And the idea is once you get up into orbit, you print these long booms that at the tips of the booms hold the telescopes. And at the center area where the printer is, there's also your combiner optics. And so you can make all this fly in a very small package, but then it gets very big once it gets into space. And uh, that's that's the thing that I'm working on with them right now. And it looks like it might have some legs. We're going to probably put in some proposals over the next year or two to uh, get a small flight demo going and uh, do some exciting things with that. Yeah, infrastructure in space seems to be hard. It's a chicken and egg problem to some extent. Yeah. We have a related question. Uh, it comes from uh, Sarah Fitzsimmons. Do you ever think that we will one day colonize Mars? Ah, so again, I always prefer the language settle rather than colonize because of historical context. And so we're trying to be good with language here nowadays. Um, but uh, I think that uh, it, it will inevitably happen, um, whether or not it's a good idea. <laughs> um, I think for whatever reason, people feel like we need to, need to send people to, to Mars. I am all in favor of it for that reason that it actually creates a very interesting infrastructure to have a substantial number of human uh, settlers elsewhere. And so I think actually the more likely and reasonable thing that we'll get as part of that is settlements on the moon and even settlements on asteroids. Uh, I think that we'll, we'll see a lot of that expansion of the human industrial base into outer space on timescales that are a lot quicker than most people realize. In fact, I think we over the last 10 years have seen a real dramatic revolution in uh, the, the industry of space and particularly access to, to space. Um, the, the fact that it doesn't work all the time, but most of the time now SpaceX recovers boosters and is aggressively pursuing a, a fully reusable uh, flight system in the form of Starship to, uh, to get access to space. I think that uh, that's going to really push things along. There, uh, there certainly were uh, a lot of misfired attempts in getting to this place in the late 90s, but we seem to have kind of gotten over the hump uh, with, with active space companies that are meeting success with reusable boosters. I take it, do you watch The Expanse? I don't, I've been, oh, wanting, to, I've been wanting to get really? into that, but- Mars, the moon, I know. the asteroids, it sounds like The Expanse. <laughs> I know, and I, uh, I want to see it, but um, the, uh, uh, television selection is is a democracy in my fa my household, and we uh, we maybe don't quite have old enough viewers for that right now. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering you have you do have children in your household, and I wonder if Pluto is a planet in the books they have or not. Uh, so I was or, very or pleased. Or do, you, do you back it up with your own family? Yeah. <laughs> I was very pleased with a the puzzle they just got that showed the solar system. And 
uh, it, it showed uh, Pluto and Eris and Ceres. And so again, this is, ne this is not always a you know, binary question on Pluto. It's, you know, there are other bodies that we know of that fit into the mix and we got to tell the whole story. Yeah, well, that's great. So Dr. Parks had a related question. Um, speaking of Star Trek, which you mentioned earlier, are you in favor of spectral typing for classifying planets? So in Star Trek, I, I think what uh, Dr. Parks is referring to is like the, you know, we've entered orbit in a, around an M-class planet or that kind of thing. Um, and so I, I would be all in favor of it if we had enough information. And so I wouldn't know how to classify things yet. Um, I think we need to know a lot more about um, the, the, the full breadth and width of what the menagerie is of, of what planets can be. And I think we've gotten a lot of whole, we still have a lot of holes in our knowledge about what planetary systems are around other stars. Um, the best example I can give of that is um, in our own planetary system, we have, you know, we have small things like Earth, because on, on those scales, or things like Earth are small, but on reasonably long orbits, year-long orbits, we know very few of those things around other stars, not because they don't exist, but because we're, it, they're very hard to detect. Same goes for even Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, that they are, uh, uh, they're big, but they're very far out. And so uh, the, the sort of techniques that astronomers use right now to detect planets are relatively insensitive to those sorts of things. And so I think they're gonna be found. Um, in fact, I maybe have a unjustified bias to uh, continuing the principle of mediocrity, which is we're gonna find that our solar system is really boring and that it's copied a jillion times over throughout the, 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 the universe, which right now the data doesn't show. Um, right now, the data shows that we find big planets really close to their stars, and that's because those are the easy things to see. Um, and I, I, I don't have any justification for for thinking that you know this principle of mediocrity will continue, but it's worked pretty well so far for the last four hundred years of of uh, applying to questions about ourselves and our quote specialness in space. Um, I think we've found that uh, every time we've we've thought something was unique to the solar system, we found that well, it's actually pretty common as as we look further out in space. Great, thank you. So, um, what we'd like to do now is transition to our telescope viewing portion of the evening. Now, we are open uh, for those oh. of you who stuck around. We're going to be able to give you some night sky virtual views. Are you willing to stick around and answer some more questions during sure. the, the telescope viewing? Okay, great. So at this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to our observatory TAs, uh, William and Kevin to introduce the telescope and then we'll take another question after that. Okay, wonderful, thank you, Peter. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, and okay, here we go. So, Right now, I'm currently connected to one of the computers on top of Research Hall. So uh, you can see we have uh, the desktop wallpaper. So we have the telescope inside the dome in uh, this uh, nice building here. And then I'm connected to a computer that's in the control room, this little building over here. Now, one of the things that makes it uh, possible to do remote observing is that we have a set of uh, webcams uh, on top of Research Hall. And they just let us uh, keep track of things and make sure uh, everything's uh, going as it should and nothing's on fire or anything like that. So if I pull up those webcams, what we can see is we have a set of three views. So we can just talk about these right quick. So on the top right, we have the inside of the control room and you can see that I'm um, connected to this computer uh, right here in the middle left. So if we were all in here uh, in person uh, or at the observatory in person, uh, we would be either in this room or in the dome uh, talking about stuff. And uh, the control room is basically where we just operate the entire telescope. So uh, student researchers would spend uh, most of their night in this uh, small room trying to get work done, but usually ending up watching YouTube. So 
that's the control room in a nutshell. And then in the bottom left, we have an outside view of the dome. So you can see the telescope peeking out through the shutter. We have a door frame uh, for kind of a rough sense of scale here. And it's about six and a half feet tall, but you can see that we have a pretty nice view. I really like that uh, telescope peeking out there. That's nice. And finally, uh, in our last uh, view here, uh, we have the actual telescope. So uh, let, me, let me see if I can position this slightly better. Uh, I think I want to go this way. And while he's repositioning it, we'll take another question for our speaker. Oh, wrong way. Um, always do you, that yeah, go ahead and readjust it. Uh, so this question, uh, do you believe there are other solar systems similar to ours with life on them? The life question. So space is a really big place. <laughs> it's tremendously large. Um, and so the, the notion that there couldn't be a place like that seems kind of outlandish to me that uh, we're you know not going to find life elsewhere um, if you look at the geologic record for earth uh, as soon as there was even a hint of habitability here on earth you find in the geologic record uh, fossils and you find evidence that there was you know bacteria bacteria on earth for a long time now there's an interesting couple of wrinkles on top of that, which is we had single celled life for a very long time here on Earth. And there was uh, a lot that it took a lot of time that it took to become something more complicated. And so potentially, we're going to find a lot of shower mold out there, and not a lot of little green men. Um, now, the other thing I always like to point out too, though, is that space is a very big place. And so the ability that say astronomers and engineers have to build things, build telescopes to remotely detect things is very good. I think the prospects of us remotely detecting life in the next 20 years, they're very high, but the ability to travel between the stars is unless we discover new physics and I have seen nothing that has given indication that we've any, any leads on doing that anytime soon, the ability to travel between the stars and visit those planets and you know use them ourselves, that seems also outlandish. Uh, so I think in the end, we'll probably find a lot of shower mold via telescope, but uh, we're not going anywhere to visit them and they probably haven't come here to visit us in their UFOs. Thank you. All right, uh, Will, what are we looking at? All right, so right now we're looking down the barrel of the telescope. So you can see a reflecting surface uh, towards the back of the tube, and that is our primary mirror. So that guy is 32 inches in diameter, or 0 0.8 meters. So this makes it uh, a reasonably large telescope. Uh, an amateur astronomer would probably be very happy to have it, but in terms of the largest telescopes in the world, uh, this guy is actually kind of puny. Uh, so some of the largest telescopes in the world are about 10 meters uh, in diameter, so about 10 times bigger than this, if you can imagine that. But nonetheless, uh, it's a nice telescope and we're happy to have it. So you can see that it's a reflecting telescope, so it uses mirrors instead of lenses. So light is going to come in through the big opening here, and it's going to bounce off the primary mirror. And then it's going to bounce up to this uh, secondary mirror here. You can see the cross bracing uh, holding it in. And then the light's going to bounce off that secondary mirror, and it's going to go through this little black tube cylinder thing uh, in the primary mirror. And that's actually a hole in the primary mirror. And once again, uh, that light is going to reflect a third time off a diagonal mirror, and it's going to go into one of the four portholes we have on the back of the telescope where we have a variety of instruments. So we have a CCD, uh, which is basically just a fancy camera, and then we have uh, an eyepiece, we have a spectrograph, and we have a near-infrared camera as well. 
So this telescope, uh, for those who are curious, uh, the optical tube is about a thousand pounds. You can see that it's attached to a fork-like structure. You'll be able to get a little bit better view of that when we move the telescope around uh, to view a target. And that fork is about a thousand pounds, and then the base of the telescope that's out of view is about two thousand pounds. And I always like to ask people how much they think the telescope costs. Uh, they always uh, like to throw out about a million dollars or so, and uh, I wish it was that much. Uh, but the telescope itself is only a uh, small three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, between twenty. 17, 2018, and 2019-ish, uh, we put about $150,000 worth of upgrades into it. So it's all together, uh, the telescope and all the instruments we have, I'd say it's around you know half a million dollars, which is still pretty great. We can see some interesting stuff with it. And speaking of seeing some interesting stuff with it, uh, we can go ahead and move to the first target of the night which is going to be the moon. So while I do that, uh, I don't know if there's another question uh, we could go yeah, to. Yeah, we'll take a question while you're moving and you can show our virtual night sky view as well and, and, and then show the night, uh, virtual view of our sky that you're looking at. We use that to control and point the telescope. We do have a hand raise from Nicholas Becker. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, I have a worksheet that I'm um, supposed to fill out for my Astronomy 103 class um so yep. just trying to make sure we, we've uh we have gotten that question in the chat thank you for raising that i was actually going to ask oh okay that's great yeah so dr parks would you like to say a few words specifically it asks about an attendee signature um thank you nicholas for asking that question uh if dr. oh well parks i got on. well i was uh i mean yeah i was wondering i was actually going to go through i was wondering if the telescope information was gone over. I mean, I was I was listening, but I'm just trying to make sure that I'm answering these questions because I yeah. know he was talking about the telescope there. Yeah, like the diameter and the focal ratio and things like that. Well, yeah, it, no, those it, are great questions. Okay. And we will continue to give you some more information about that. But if Dr. Parks is there, he can jump on and um, answer any other questions you might have. So you can send him a chat. I think you can send him a chat. Uh, let me know if you can. Yeah, I can send him a chat. Great. Uh, Dr. Parks? Yeah, I'm here, um, and I, I will certainly respond to any questions directed my way. Yeah, what should they do with the uh, attendance signature? Oh, um, just supply a screenshot. Uh, when we actually start looking at an object, specifically, the, the I believe we're going to be looking at the moon, just supply a screenshot of us looking at the moon. That'll be, that'll be sufficient. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you, Nicholas, for that question. It's a great question. Um, and then, Will, you want to tell us what we're looking at now as we uh, move the telescope? Yeah, so uh, right now uh, we can see the back of the telescope coming into view while we're slowing to the moon. So we can see the instruments coming in. So we have uh, the one that's coming into our view right now. It looks like we have a couple of handles on the back of it, and that right there is our spectrograph. So that just takes light and it divides it into its uh, constituent components. So you can think of it like a prism uh, with white light shining through it and breaking it up into its rainbow of colors. So that's basically what the spectrograph does. And then a little bit below that right here, we have an eyepiece. And if we were there in person, we would obviously be looking through that instead of the CCD. But uh, we're stuck with the CCD uh, for now. So. On the opposite side of the eyepiece, you can see we kind of have this black uh, disc almost, and that is actually part of the CCD. It's actually holding a set of filters, that's uh, a filter wheel, and it allows us to look at the sky in particular uh, colors. So we can look at the red light in the sky, the blue light, the ultraviolet light, or we can look at, uh, say, something like H-alpha, which is a very narrow and very red uh, wavelength of light. So we can see that the dome is actually spinning in the background and the moon uh, in the top corner is coming into view. So we'll just wait for the dome to stop spinning and then I can grab an image. Yeah, we actually got a nice little preview there of what we're gonna be looking at, right? It's gonna be the moon, great. And if you have any other questions, uh, please post them in the chat. We're happy to answer them for our speaker. 
Mm-hmm. Hey, Peter, I can I can show you a telescope too. Yeah. Oh, can you live? Yep. All right. Yeah. After we'll switch off. We'll do a second telescope. We'll get between two telescopes. Tonight, right? <laughs> That's right. Okay. I, I know your telescopes. You have more. I'm jealous. You have more of them, and they're bigger. The one, the one I'll show is smaller. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, take an image of the moon. So uh, if I pull up the software we have to take images, uh, you'll see this image I have that I actually took about 20 minutes ago or so. So you can see we have a a very nice uh, waxing crescent. So if I take another image, uh, let's see if this changes much at all. I have a feeling it won't change much. Might move around a little bit, we'll see. Uh, and then we have a question from the audience while this is coming out. Is this is this a refractor telescope? No, it's not a refractor telescope. It's a reflector telescope. So the difference between a refractor and a reflector is that a reflector uses mirrors instead of lenses. So the light is going to bounce off the mirrors in our telescope. And for a refractor telescope, it would uh, pass through the lenses. Cool. It, it actually updated, but it looks exactly the same. Yeah, pretty much. That's good. That means the telescope can point pretty well. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. All right. So here we have uh, a nice image of the moon. So we can immediately see uh, quite a few uh, surface details. So we have these smaller uh, little craters dotted uh, around the moon. Then we also have these bigger dark depressions. So these big darker spots are called the lunar maria, and they were formed by ancient lava flows that just carved out some chunks in the moon and just left behind these dark patches. Then we have these brighter areas on the moon called the lunar highlands. And what's actually interesting about the maria is that uh, I think they cover something around 15% of the moon's surface, but Uh, The Maria are much more uh, abundant on the side of the moon that's facing us. So the moon is tidally locked with Earth, meaning that we only see one side of the moon uh, from our viewpoint on Earth. There's a whole other dark side, so to speak, uh, of the moon that we don't really see. Uh, We've sent probes to it and we've gotten views of it, but, you know, on Earth we don't really see that. And the Maria uh, on the other side of the moon actually aren't very common. So that's an interesting little fact. So the moon itself, uh, as you probably have heard, it's about four and a half billion years old, about the age of the Earth. And it's a very close by, about 250,000 miles uh, from the Earth. And looks like someone is zooming in so we can take a closer look. If we zoom in too much though, things will get a little blurry. Yeah, I was just zooming in. Go ahead, keep going. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the moon was formed uh, when Earth uh, was still molten. So there was uh, the best idea that we have for how this guy formed is there was a a body about the size of Mars that smacked into Earth when the Earth was still forming. So it was all hot and molten and liquidy and goopy. And then that whack uh, into Earth kicked up a lot of stuff into the orbit around Earth, and eventually all that stuff coalesced uh, into the moon. So that idea is, like I said, the best thing we have. Um, And the uh, elements, elemental abundance between the moon and the Earth's mantle are pretty similar, but it's not a perfect match. So it does leave uh, some questions, but uh, that's uh, about the best we can do. So This is uh, the moon in a nutshell. So it's one of my favorite things uh, to look at through the telescope, mainly because you can just get a whole bunch of detail. And one last thing I'll say about it uh, is if we actually zoom out a tiny bit here, Uh, You might think that the best time to look at the moon is when it's a full moon. You take your telescope, you point it at the bright full moon, and you get the best view, but that's actually not uh, necessarily the case. Uh, You see this dark band that's going down the moon, uh, and that line is called the terminator. And to get the best view of the moon uh, with your own telescope, it's actually uh, best to point it uh, along the terminator. And so that uh, contrast between light and dark is going to bring out a whole bunch of craters, uh, more so than you would see if you were just looking at some random given bright 
uh, patch on the moon. So uh, that's uh, everything I want to talk about with the moon. Great. Thanks, Will. Uh, so we're going to move to another target, but I want to take some questions. And I also want to give the opportunity for Dr. Van Bell to share his telescope. This would be a first on our public evening under the stars in history, even during this pandemic when we've had virtual speakers. So our talks are posted to YouTube afterwards uh, with your permission, Dr. Van Bell. And uh, I would be honored to have a second telescope on our show tonight. So go ahead and start sharing your screen. And while you're doing that, um, I'll ask Will a couple of questions from the audience, and then we'll uh, we'll see our second telescope of the night. It'd be interesting to look at the same thing with the same telescope. We'll see what you got. Um, and then uh, next, I want to um, ask uh, Will, uh, is this a Cassegrain telescope? What And what is the aperture in, of the telescope and the field of view that we were looking at the moon with? Okay, so uh, yes, uh, it is a Cassegrain telescope. So that's just um, uh, the full technical name of the telescope. It's that's a Ritchie Cretion Cassegrain reflector telescope. So there's a bunch of uh, you know baggage that comes with all those terms, but yeah, it is a Cassegrain. Uh, the field of view that we were looking at uh, right now is about 26 arc minutes in so about 26 arc minutes across. So what's an arc minute for those of you who don't know? Well, if you take a circle, uh, you have 360 degrees in a circle. And then if you divide that 360 degrees into 60 pieces, uh, you get, uh, yeah, and then you take one of those pieces and divide it into 60 bits, you get an arc minute, it's 26 of those, so. Looks like we have a new telescope up. So yeah, we have dueling telescopes tonight. Evening under the stars first. <laughs> this Dr. is actually Lundell, so. Feel free to tell us what we're looking at. So this is uh, a twenty-inch telescope here on a L five hundred mount. Both of those from Plane Wave. It's actually got a outboard telescope, a twelve and a half inch uh, telescope from uh, RC Systems from Arcos. Uh, that we use as well. Um, these uh, plane wave telescopes, these plane wave mounts are very interesting to use because they have direct drive motors. So they're wicked fast. So if you tell it to go somewhere, this thing just zips along. And uh, right now oh boy, though- you make me jealous. That is a fast telescope. Oh yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, wow. Yeah, you know the yeah, is that the Navy? Do they just tend to have faster? But well, this is plane wave, so it's it's just standard stuff from plane wave. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, it, it really cruises. The uh, the other things from plane wave do the same thing, and so you can just send it places, and uh, it goes off and running. Look at um, that! Yeah, wow. I think we can move ours faster a little bit, but not this fast. This is pretty yeah. slick. Well, and so that's the slew speed, and the track speed is pretty much the same as well. So you can easily track satellites and, and, and low earth satellites and, and take pictures of things. So um, unfortunately the weather is such that I'm leaving the dome shut right now. And, um, and the dome is actually broken right now. So I'm leaving it shut. <laughs> we, um, we blew out our dome controller a couple weeks ago and we just got the, the repair back today, but I don't think it's been installed yet. Um, but uh, yeah, these, uh, you know, it's all, very similar sorts of stuff compared to uh, your facility, I'm sure. Um, on the back side, we have, again, a CCD camera right here and a filter wheel that lets us take different colors of uh, images. Uh, this one is set up to do uh, uh, very precise photometry. Uh, so many different colors on the things you're looking at. The, the filter wheel has 20 positions. And so we have uh, 17 filters that let us take pictures of uh, stars and other objects in 17 very specific colors. And uh, my goal for that is to be able to reconstruct the distribution of energy coming from the, the, the sources on the sky from the blue all the way to the red. And that helps out with uh, determining the temperatures of stars. Well, you're also at a much better site than we are too. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, I mean, you could tell us about Flagstaff, Arizona, what's special about it. I would never guess Arizona would have a place uh, as high an altitude as it does. Uh, but that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, here in Flagstaff, we're actually at pretty high altitude. 
Um, we're at about 7,000 feet already. Uh, so I can look at outside actually and see a bunch of snow that's on the ground that we've had for quite a while. Um, it's usually clear. And so I, you can see the all sky cam here that's uh, showing the current weather, which is not clear, which is uh, pretty unusual for us. Um, we have, we lose about a third of the nights of the year to weather, but the, 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 the principal component of that is in kind of late July, early August to the monsoon season. And so we typically have pretty good skies around here. Uh, I think the median seeing up on Mars Hill is about uh, one arc second is the median. Um, and then some of the sites that we have outside of Mars Hill, uh, we have other observatory sites around, around town. It's more like uh, 0.9 or 0.8. And that helps out a lot, that, that little bit. Not, not uh, much of our audience would know what an arc second is, but uh, if you take a degree, uh, you have 360 degrees in a circle and you divide a degree into 60, each one of those is called an arc minute. And if you divide each one of those arc minutes into 60, it's called an arc second. Our conditions here on the Fairfax campus, where we have a lot more light pollution to begin with, um, we also, uh, was, I'm jealous, look at that. Um, I have, we, have, we have a question coming up for you as well. But uh, oh, we that? typically have three to five arc seconds seen, and the best I've ever recorded since I've been here is uh, two arc seconds. But we still do lots of great science with it with test follow up in 0.8 meters. It's a perfect telescope for that. So the question uh, from the audience um, is, uh, you know, we, we have two different telescopes we've seen tonight. Pretty cool. Uh, you said yours is a, a 20 inch and we have a 32 inch. How does changing the aperture affect the view of the night sky? As it increases, do smaller, dimmer, more distant objects be visible? Why, why does aperture matter? Well, the basic thing, at bigger aperture gives you two things, which is um, more grab in terms of collecting photons off the sky. But then the other benefit is you get more um, uh, resolution. So as your as your telescope gets bigger, you actually can pick out finer detail on the sky. And um, with the 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 biggest telescopes, um, you often run into a limit. Here we go. Let me pop off of this. There we go. You run into a limit where. Um, once you go past a certain size, the, the, the increasing resolution, the increasing ability to pick out fine detail in the sky, it gets kind of uh, ruled out by the fact that when you're looking through the Earth's atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere is this turbulent boiling medium that smears things out. This is why to your eye, stars twinkle through a bigger aperture. Um, the, it just is a smearing effect. And we have technologies in astronomy that try to sidestep that, that try to recover the full resolving power, the full spatial resolving power of big apertures, but they're kind of tricky to get to work. And so they're, they're not straightforward, but, but we, we've gotten good at that kind of thing over time. Looks like a source. Yeah, we're looking at something. Um, so this question I'll next ask for uh, Will and Kevin, what is a CCD camera name um, and while you're answering that, I'll try to adjust the image display a little bit to bring out some of the detail while you're telling us also what we're looking at. So uh, the name of the CCD camera is at uh, the STX 16803. So I, I hope that's what you were looking for. Yeah, can you repeat please? Uh, STX 16803. And as far as what we're looking at, uh, this bright dot here we have is Mars, oh, cool. uh, which is uh, a planet solely inhabited by robots. It's uh, about a tenth the mass of Earth and about half of its diameter. It uh, revolves around the sun every 687 days. So significantly longer than our Earth year, uh, but its rotation period is about the same of about 24 hours. Now, because it's uh, revolving around the Earth um, much farther out at a different rate than ours, uh, the distances between Earth and Mars varies wildly depending on where in our respective orbits we are. It can be as close as 30 million miles or as far away as like 250 million miles. 
Now, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, Mars has a reddish color, although you can't see it here through the CCD camera, but that reddish Martian landscape is caused by iron minerals on the surface, and uh, those iron minerals rust, and this causes the soil and the atmosphere to take on that uh, classic reddish hue. Uh, Mars is actually going to be host to a new visitor, uh, actually tomorrow, the Perseverance rover was launched about seven months ago and it's going to be landing on the Martian surface tomorrow at about 4 p.m. after traveling about 300 million miles through space to get there. Uh, a couple more facts about Mars. Uh, like the Earth, it has been found to have two permanent polar ice caps made of water ice primarily. And it also hosts the largest volcano in the solar system called Olympus Mons. It's also the, just the tallest mountain on a planet that we have found. It also has uh, two small moons that we can't see in this image, Phobos and Deimos. Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, so I think at this point, uh, we'd like to thank our speaker again. I think, do we want to look at one more target? I can, uh, yeah, Peter. we have time. We yeah, can move and to the Dr. Van Bell, go ahead. I could show you two more telescopes. Oh, the... I'd rather do that, honestly. <laughs> yeah, let's do that while we slew to another target. That sounds fantastic. There we go. So that last one I showed you was at uh, Mars Hill, um, where the, the main historic campus of Lowell Observatory is. And then in the 60s, we opened up Anderson Mesa, which was um, uh, about 10 miles outside of town. And that's where my array of telescopes are. And we're uh, in the process of integrating some larger telescopes into the array. The array currently uses five inch telescopes, uh, so 12 centimeter, but we now have uh, three one meter telescopes uh, out at the site. And so two of them are in their domes now. And so this is a view of the two of them. And uh, we're getting ready to link them into the interferometer. But since it's a interferometer and the, 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 the principle behind it is getting the light from multiple telescopes and interfering them to synthesize a bigger telescope. Um, the, um, that, that's where the name interferometer, inter, interferometer comes from. Um, the, 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 the ability to move the telescopes around, it's basically like changing the zoom on your camera lens. And so you wanna be able to have the telescopes close together at times and at other times you wanna move them far apart. And so uh, somebody silly, that would be me, came up with this idea of, putting the domes on trailers and being able to pull them around the site. And so we now have domes. These are uh, 16 foot Astro Haven domes on trailers. Can't really see the wheels that well in this one, uh, but you can hitch them up to a Dodge truck and yank them around the site and have them close together like this, or we can move them apart uh, up to about a thousand feet apart from each other and uh, have them synthesize a telescope that's a thousand feet in size. Um, and so we're busy getting this technology going. And so this is kind of an exciting thing we have uh, under development out at the site right now. That is amazing. I happen to remember, like, I think it was a 10 micron interferometer from mm -hmm. Berkeley, like a 20 years ago. And yep. didn't they have their telescopes on trucks too? Yep. Yeah, this is, yep. this is they, they had a very uh, similar kind of thing where you could hitch it up and drive it around. And this... This setup isn't street legal, but it's perfectly fine for us on our closed site. That's pretty wild. So uh, what happens if you get a flat tire? <laughs> uh, well, there's spares right there, don't you see? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I, I have designs on someday this being uh, a major attraction on the 4th of July parade, but uh, we'll see. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah that makes sense. I mean, some of the Alma... I mean, I, the ALMA telescopes move too, but thanks thanks for uh, sharing yep. two more telescopes. It's been an eventful night here. And we <laughs> see that the earth is round, just the sun is just setting there, but we're, we're it's pretty dark here already. Yep. Um, okay, and then back and, to- And then with uh, that, I have to bow out. So thank, thank you, Dr. Van for joining us. Let's give one more round of applause thank for you. our speaker. Thank you very much. All right. I'll Bye -bye. turn it back over to Will and Kevin after that. Okay, hey, have a good night. Mm -hmm.
All right, and then uh, we'll just have one more target tonight, and uh, Kevin can tell us all about it. Looks like he's still uh, finagling the image. Yeah, okay. So what we've moved to now is called the Orion Nebula, uh, called so because uh, it is located uh, nearby the Orion constellation. And uh, <clears throat> this is a diffuse nebula. It's inside the Milky Way. It's one of the brightest nebula uh, being visible to the naked eye, actually, on a clear night. And uh, it's a measly 1,300 light years away. And it's about 24 light years across. Uh, this is a big collection of stars and star forming material. It's about 2,000 times the mass of the sun. And these nebula are often referred to as stellar nurseries uh, because these are regions of star formation. And uh, we can see as the contrast is changing, uh, the surrounding gas and dust. And if we decrease that contrast further, uh, we can see a cluster in the very middle uh, with some very fresh bright stars in the middle. Uh, these are part of what's called the trapezium open cluster. And they are relatively young for stars. And uh, if we looked at this through different filters or in person through the eyepiece uh, in real color, you'd see a bluish green color in the gas and dust around them. Uh, this is from ionized oxygen. All right, thanks to whoever is adjusting the image in the contrast. Yeah, I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah. Giving some views. Yeah, so what, what I'm doing, just for explanation for everyone on the call, the, the digital camera, much like the digital cameras in your phone, will count how many photons hit. And so each pixel records a number of um, photoelectrons, as they're called, electrons that have been freed up by photons that have hit the pixels. And so it's really just a number. And then we map that number into a grayscale intensity that you see on the screen. So I can change how it looks just by changing how we convert those numbers uh, into the intensity on a screen. Cool, Kevin, any other facts? Um, I think that's about all that I have for it. Yeah, these stars are about a million years old. Uh, located about 1,200 light years away uh, and is, is a famous star forming region. And if, if you go to a really dark sky and look at the constellation Orion and look at the sword, you can just barely tell it's a fuzzy blob. Uh, and this is, this is our view of the night sky. All right. Well, um, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Will. Thank you to our speaker who had to go. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight at our virtual evening under the stars. We would like to welcome you back in two weeks for our speaker, uh, Dr. Jason Wright from Penn State University. And I'd like to tell everyone to have a good night. Stay safe tomorrow uh, with the snowstorm hitting if you're in the Northern Virginia area. And if you're a student here at Mason, uh, we do have a student club called Friends of the Observatory. You can find us at Mason 360. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you. you.